Good yeah. morning. Good morning. Yep. I'm Tony. I'm Buster. And we are going to answer your life questions today. Uh, I guess uh, you should go ahead and ask questions if you have them, but we have some. Uh, um, listening to Clay Aiken soak while soaking in a bubble bath with candles. All right. <laughs> <laughs> You're better set up than we are. <laughs> okay, that's how we'll record our next one. Um, <laughs> Buster, should we give our credentials or no? Uh, Screw sure. the credentials. Well, no, really? I don't care. You think people will just trust life advice from two strangers well, they're on not the internet? Thinking. Yeah, let's just go with that. All right, <laughs> two strangers on the internet give you life advice. Uh, let's start with a question that was given to us ahead of time. What is the one habit that everyone should create resulting in the most general life improvement? Is it meditation, consistent exercise, rising early, something else? I like one the habit. idea that your life is just one habit. Dude, it's one eating. habit away from perfection. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> right. That's wishful thinking, isn't it? Uh, what was your answer to this? Um, I haven't come up with an answer yet, but let's see. Let me, let me see the card again. Resulting in the most general life improvement. Um, so yeah, meditation is a good one. I would actually, my favorite habit that I think uh, works on a daily basis is free writing. Um, free writing is, is a, like, you know, you just wake up in the morning and you do 750 words of, or three pages of, of just brain dump, um, getting your system, your brain clear of all of its crazy ideas, all the things you're stressing about, all the open loops that um, aren't, aren't resolved, the things that are creating anxiety that you might not even be aware of under the surface. Um, that's the one that personally benefits me the most. Um, and it sort of plays into this whole, like, you know, it's not going to make your life better by itself, but it sort of enables, you know, uh, so you, self-knowledge. When you de described this to me the first time, you actually described it as, uh, an equivalent to meditation in a lot of ways. Yeah. I think it's better than meditation in a lot of ways because <laughs> it's, well, I'll, so it's better than meditation because it's easier and it's more accessible. So people have a hard time going to meditation and and uh, figuring out, um, you know, what do I do? What am I supposed to think? Am I doing it right? Yeah. Free writing is more, you sit down, there's a blank screen, you start typing or you start writing in a notebook, um, and it's obvious that you're doing it. And, you know, when you're done, you're done. Versus meditation, like the timer goes off, you're like, did I do it? Did I fall asleep? What happened? So you, when people are free writing, you don't feel like they struggle with just editing themselves? I mean, I know the definition of free writing is that there's no editing. Editing but still, this, the definition of meditation is doesn't, you know, doesn't allow for a lot of self-criticism, and yet that's what trips a lot of people up. Yeah, I mean, I think editing happens, but because if you do it regularly, uh, you know, you, you get into the flow of just typing, and yeah. when your fingers are moving, and then the, the thoughts have stopped. Yeah. You're like, well, they're going to keep typing, and something's going to come out. It's going to be like, blah, 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 whatever. I went to the, I gotta go to the grocery store. Yeah, I gotta right. buy these things. You know, I gotta. Oh man, I'm so angry at this person. I wish I would have said this. Right. Um, and all that stuff starts like just flowing because you're in this physical so momentum like, of, of typing. So if for the beginner, or for the someone with writer's block and free writing, which shouldn't even happen, the instruction could literally be just type blah, 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 and blah. blah, 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 blah until. Well, I, I do that all the time. Half, sometimes that's half laws. Really? And a lot of it's like, See, I'm so tired, I'm tired, man, this sucks, I wish I wasn't doing this, can't believe I have a meeting in 20 minutes. <laughs> um, see, I, I like that real world experience, right? So it's, I think a lot of people get tripped up on these new habits because they expect to be doing it perfectly, and then they think, well, I didn't do it perfectly, so it's not for me. But here you are, like, you've created 750 words, which is often used for free writing, you use it for free writing, and a typical thing from you is just a bunch of bullshit. Mm -hmm. Right. All right. Yeah. No, it's <laughs> absolutely like, you know, my, my answer is going to be meditation and my meditations are super weak, like uh, two to four minutes tops. But um, as far as I can tell, it's the number one thing. And certainly in the list that the question gave us, uh, meditation does a lot more for me than exercise and, and rising early. And it's almost like a prerequisite for those things. It's like uh, push-ups for your brain, and it's calming, and so when I'm in that meditation practice, I walk around in a better mood and with more control over where I put my focus, and 
that makes it a great keystone uh, keystone habit. All right. We should come back to this one. I think there's more we can see in there. Oh, really? Yeah. All right. Um, all right, this is a, Jim asks. And if you guys have questions, you can just type them in. We'll try to read them and hopefully remember what they are. Maybe I should write them down somewhere. I don't know. Should we get a pen and write them out on this board? Yeah, I'll write them down if I see something. If you guys have great. questions. Um, also, hearts. Apparently, hearts are a big deal. Look, I can, I can give myself hearts. There you go. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> hearts are a really big deal. Um, so Jim asks, I don't let's say Jim in Cincinnati, uh, what is the single biggest reason we fail on habit formation? What's the single biggest reason? A lot of these, like, you want the one answer. I know. People are all other answers. <laughs> people are so looking for absolutes. Um, you go first. My answer was statistics. Like, my experience is that people set so many goals that uh, there's no way that they're going to get them all done. So it's easy to pick a habit that you didn't actually achieve. But, uh, and I just always, like, i am always reframe things in the positive, is how many habits did you achieve? Like, how many improvements did you make? Is it possible for everyone to improve their life in one way every day? That, to me, that's a, be a better question than, like, well, I failed at flossing my teeth. Well, I succeeded at going to the gym. And that, um, if I wasn't doing either of those things, then um, uh, it's a net improvement. All right, we're gonna get how to how- sleep early. Yeah. Okay. What's your answer to this? Okay, so first I wanna dig into that. Like, I think, um, so you're saying that maybe the reason people fail is because they created a, a framework of failure that's you know, sort of broken or- Yeah. Like where they create a goal that they don't even, that doesn't actually capture success and they yeah. fail at, the, at, at it, something else. It almost, it turns out that uh, it's just a matter of you didn't, it's not the thing that you actually wanted to do. That you had a hundred things that you thought for a brief moment in time you wanted to do, and then two of them you actually did. And, uh, and I think that's sort of what I think is going on is, uh, I don't know, a lot of my worldview right now is from the book Thinking Fast and Slow. Right? Right, and you're reading it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I feel like this is one of those books you don't necessarily have to finish. To yes, it honest. is. Um, you have to read it like three times. Uh, <laughs> but so I think you rationally prioritize what you want to do in your life and then you're whatever the system to the slow emotional uh, thinking part of your brain just quietly reprioritizes everything when you're not looking and so it just like things just drop out and that's my experience is mostly I'm failing on things because they dropped out and I was like yeah rationally I should eat more vegetables and like, I'm totally committed to that. But the second I stop thinking about it, it gets reprioritized to be a focus on work, which I love, and exercise, which I also love. Hmm. And a lot of people don't like exercise, but exercise habits are, I think, work for me, because I had just happened to like them. Cool. So can I introduce like a really cheesy metaphor before Cheese. answering this question? Yes, okay. absolutely. So sort of getting to like, uh, you know, what's the one habit and uh, your answer to be like how your brain reprioritizes <laughs> reprioritizes things. Um, I yeah. sort of think of behavior change, you know, as you're the chef in the kitchen, right? You're the chef in a restaurant, yeah. And or maybe you're just the owner of the restaurant, okay. And the owner of the restaurant comes in every morning, is like, "All right, everyone, we're gonna cook the most amazing souffle. We're gonna serve it at lunch or breakfast." Yeah. Um, and all right, I'm out, right? And then the, the chef is like. Okay, well, do we have the ingredients for that? You know, do we, right. do the customers want that? Uh, is our restaurant even the right kind of restaurant right. for us? Maybe we're maybe we're a sushi restaurant. Like the souffle is not going to fit into that sushi restaurant. Um, so if you think about, you know, you've got your your conscious will coming in and saying, "I want to meditate today." Um, uh, one of the problems with that, you know, that then you say like, "Okay, well." Then yeah. leave it to the restaurant to either succeed or fail at that in the day, um, but there's not a cause and effect uh, right. chain between what the chef or the owner says and what the restaurant does. But if you want that to happen on the restaurant, you have to, you know, make sure that they have the right ingredients. Make I, sure that you're in the right spot. Make sure that the customers actually want that. Make sure that's in the right price range. Make sure that people would buy it. Um, and then, and then maybe okay. So it's getting really abstract, but yeah, yeah. Um, the yeah. idea is you're not. 
you're not just the designer and the commander of, of your habits, you are also the doer and the enjoyer of your habits. And you have to really think in the framework of, hey, I'm the chef, like where am I gonna get these ingredients for meditation? Do I have the right time in the day to yep. do it? Do my do my sous chefs like, you know, do they accept this as a as a, a new dish? Like do we, you know, have we actually tested this with the customers? Like, am I going to enjoy this? Like, that's really the, the loop that we should be thinking about this in. The parallel I immediately thought of as you were thinking of this is in, in entrepreneurship, where there's a bunch of people walking around thinking, I had a great idea, you know, am I special? And it actually, in, a, in building a company or doing a startup, the idea is nothing. It is like, <clears throat> it's less than 1%. Like, not even, like, 1% would be a stretch. And so, like, I think what you're saying is, for a habit, the intent to do the habit is not the same as doing that habit. There's this incredible amount of baking or cooking yeah. that goes into it, um, into designing that habit. Yeah, and I would, I would say that the habit industry in general has, has perpetrated this problem by creating a separation between the designer of the habit and the doer of the habit, because the uh, allure of the habit is hey, I'm going to design this thing, and then my subconscious brain is just going to do it for in perpetuity, right? Yeah. And there's a separation between the, the, the thinker and the doer, when really, you are the doer, and um, you should think about yourself not only as like, you know, what should I do, but... So who do you think the biggest criminals in the habit industrial complex are? Uh, everyone that's... Uh, <laughs> everyone. Everyone that's trying to make money off of this industry, because <laughs> you for you force yourself to start thinking about how do I sell this to yeah. someone that's been disappointed a thousand times before, um, you know. And I'm not saying that you're evil or anything, but you know, you're forced to <laughs> you're forced to think about this in terms of like how do I sell this, um, and and uh, but you know I would say that the bigger bigger um, villains in the space are the ones that are really um, you know the bigger chains that are trying to make millions of dollars on, you know, trying to sell billions of books and have TV shows and, you know, uh, that's, and is this like the Dr. Oz's of the world? I don't even know Dr. Oz enough to say that it's him. Yeah, I just I, know he had headlines today. Yeah. I have no idea why people are complaining about him. Right on the other hand, people like Tony Robbins, I think that's, he's been doing the selling of this for years, but yeah. he also truly, if you dig into his message, he will unwrap the marketing and start, you know, right. talking about the rest of the problem. Um, someone asked thoughts, thoughts on, on Pavlov. I almost wore my Pavlov today, and then I decided I would wait and maybe get um, <laughs> uh, the Pavlov founder on as a guest. I don't even know what Pavlov is. Oh my god. <laughs> it, this is what I would describe it as. The most press-friendly product that will never sell. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, <laughs> but it, it's a watch that gives you electric shocks. Oh, that one. Right, right, right. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's just, not going to work. <laughs> but so I talked to the founder about it, and he said actually the best way to use it is to administer the shocks yourself as a form of aversion therapy. And uh, so I did this. I uh, have um, a bad habit of treating myself at Walgreens. I just I walk by thousands of Walgreens every day, and I'm like, do I need a snack? This is a terrible idea. And so now, when I'm wearing the Pavlok, every time I pass the Walgreens, I'll give myself a shock. And uh, I so think- you have one? You're oh, that's right, you were wearing one. Yeah, I do have one. I, I like it too, it's like this, I just like the watch. It's so, it's got this kind of industrial, I don't know, it's, it's got this funny design to it that I think is pretty cool. It's different than all the super slick, you know, Apple stuff that's coming out. Yeah, my, my take on it is that um, these self-sabotage tools, you know, we were all trained to uh, avoid negative uh, right. uh, feedback. And right. so the thought is like, oh, if I just create this loop of negative feedback, I will stop doing whatever I'm trying to train myself not to do. Right. But really what your brain's gonna be is like, oh, Pavlok is bad, it hurts me. Uh, let's not put that on the tip today because I don't want to be shocked. So that's, uh, that the same thing happens with Stick and with all these like, you know, Ulysses, contract apps that are like, I'm gonna sabotage myself or blackmail myself into doing this. Uh, no one's ever really done that, I don't think. It does, it does speak to <laughs> a certain level of desperation in this industry. It's like, ah, oh, nothing worked. What if I <laughs> administer shocks to myself? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, you really have to, I think, have tried a lot of things that failed before you think, yeah, that's a good idea. I, I'll do, 
all sh shock therapy. <laughs> yeah, if you have more questions, keep on uh, sending them in. We'll try to, to read them and say them. And the hearts. The hearts are always good. They make the purple us, hearts are me, so. <laughs> they make us happy. <laughs> um, uh, someone asked in the chat, and I just wrote it down, exactly what should I do right now? <laughs> what should you do right now? Hearts. Hearts. Jeez. <laughs> It's not that complicated. What about that? I'll pay money to the Nazis if I feel at. Yeah, that's same problem. <laughs> it, same problem. Yeah, no, we're not. I think we're not big believers in general. I, although the thing is, to some degree, they've worked for somebody. I feel like that's actually something they've worked for the co-founders, probably. No, they work. They've got to work for some people in this space. Like that's why they continue to stick around. I think they work for the press. They work for like getting on, you know, TV shows. Like how outrageous is the latest, you know, yeah, self sabotage app. But I mean, one of your things is that success rates across this industry are just like incredibly low. Like I saw a hit piece on future uh, plans for Coach on me. Uh, oh, we'll, t we'll we'll tell you everything. Um, <laughs> But I saw a hit piece on AA once that was like, you know, less than 5% of people go completely sober through AA. And I was just like, well, actually, that's fantastic. You know, I mean, it, what we wish is that there was like a magic pill that everyone who wanted to be sober could go sober. But in fact, it's incredibly hard. And it's not like there's an alternative that is so much better. So I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Pavlok and these other things actually work for um, a minority of people, just like a lot of tools only work for a minority of people. I heard this awesome thing the other day, which was that if you buy a lottery ticket six hours before the draw, yeah, there's a 50-50 chance of winning or dying before the draw happens. What? <laughs> <laughs> which I think is the same thing that happens for a lot of these tools. Like yeah. you, you, you have the app, you have the thing, you start using it, yeah. and there's a 50-50 chance of I mean, there's a chance of random success because you were going to be successful anyway because, right. during that time, um, or because the app caused it. Um, and I think that's the the float of like you know why any app will get five percent um, success rates. Getting to thirty percent or eighty percent, you know, is is where I think we should still strive for. You know, I was telling my mom some success story from Coach Tommy, <clears throat> mo mostly because I thought you know it should be proud. I mean, I was you know, sort of fishing for compliments. And uh, she said, she actually, what she said to me really stuck. She said, well, you've done good work because what you've done is you provided a vehicle for somebody's hopes and that got them moving. And so that's, I think, a lot of things, I mean, I guess this is uh, um, uh, like sort of placebo a little bit, but it's actually, it's true. It's like, you have to get motivated by a fantasy of it, of it actually working. And a lot of times that's enough. What are successful anchors and triggers for completely unrelated habits? How does music help for the same? Do squats? Do squats? Oh, oh, so that's the. Oh, I see. This is the Tim Ferriss or like tiny habits. Yeah, this is the BJ Fogg stuff. BJ Fogg. Yeah. Um, you can talk about that one. <laughs> so I mean, the first step in, or almost the second step, the first step of tiny habits is to take your goal and break it down into a very tiny habit. And so the canonical example is not super inspiring, but it is flossing related, uh, which I actually have a lot of data that says that people are not inspired by flossing for common sense uh, outcome, but uh, I've actually tested that. So, so, but the example is instead of flossing all your teeth, floss one tooth. But then the second step is that you anchor it to a pre-existing habit. So hopefully you already brush your teeth at least, and so you'd say floss one tooth after brushing. But some people have taken that a step forward, and they will start pairing unrelated habits. So they'll say, do 10 squats after brushing your teeth. I, I mean, I, so going back to the kitchen metaphor, yeah. like, I think this tiny habit idea is like saying, well, what if we just serve, what, what if we want to serve ramen for lunch. Uh, what if we just served one noodle to see if anybody ate it, <laughs> right? And, and okay, if somebody eats that noodle, then we'll serve two noodles the next day. Yeah. When really like, well, we're a, we're a pizza restaurant, you know, no one's gonna ever buy the final thing. Like maybe they'll be curious to like, maybe just the curiosity and novelty effect of like flossing one tooth will keep me going. Um, but you really should think about the holistic picture and a chef who's like, hey, just, just you know, do this one small thing, right? So right after you chop the carrots, chop the onions, right? You're micromanaging your kitchen saying, all right, we're gonna do this. Um, it might work if you don't trust your staff at all. If you don't trust your brain and your subconscious to 
to integrate the reason why you want to floss. But, you know, and maybe it works in a world where you're the, the strict, you know, militaristic commander of your actions. But yeah. I think most people want to exist in a, in a brain where there's back and forth, there's a narrative, there's a reason for doing things. And triggers goes around that I, I personally think they work for certain people, but they're not, hmm. they're, they give you early results and they probably don't get you all the way there. Hmm. So I'm just going to say negative things about every single habit <laughs> strategy out there. Buster, <laughs> Buster has, has, a, has a lot of experience with uh, how difficult this space is. Uh, oh wait, I missed one. Oh. The tiny habits have worked for somebody. Man, um, we should be able to scroll these comments. I think. Is there actually a way? There's not a way. Oh, really? It's, know, a, it's, it's a very a big uh, request, I know. All right. so. Well, sorry, <clears> we missed <throat> that one. Uh, but we liked it. So some tiny, habit, tiny, habit, tiny habits do work for people. Um, the question is, is it sustainable and does it work for everyone? Do we recommend Pomodoro? Pomodoro? <laughs> How did you get so many followers on the Coach to Me Twitter app as compared to Lift Up? Uh, this is actually uh, funny. I was sitting on a, a personal account with 500,000 Twitter followers, which is rare. I think most people who have that many followers don't just sit on it. Um, you know, I'm one of the first users of Twitter, and so I was experimenting really early on, and I put this, uh, built this quotes app, uh, I Heart Quotes, and it just uh, reposted quotes uh, like 10 times a day for a couple of years, and it's built up from 1,000 followers to 30,000 followers to a couple hundred, all the way up to 500,000 followers. And then the system that I was using to post the quotes broke down, and for two years, I did nothing with it. And uh, I knew I wanted to keep the Lift app account around uh, and that I wanted a new one for Coach Dummy. I just thought, well, why don't we just repurpose it? It's in the same category. And it is, I mean, it is my prerogative, I guess. And uh, so that's it. That's the real story of how, that's my growth hack uh, for getting 500,000 followers. You can always pivot to quotes if this doesn't work out too. Yeah. You know, right, I pivot back to quotes. <laughs> uh, the, um, uh, my other, like, actually most of my followers are not earned in my opinion. You know, for the hearts, guys. Yeah. <laughs> Whoever's green's doing awesome. For truth. <laughs> for truth. For truth. All right. Uh, I have a question that scrolled by earlier. Why do we all want to be different than we are today? Because we suck. We're terrible people. You know what I really always hated? I always hated about the early behavior design events I'd go to? Is it just felt like a lot of really judgmental people. It was like, I described <clears throat> this one mobile health conference as a room full of thin people trying to fix fat people. And if a single fat person had walked into that room, they would have been so offended. They're just like, oh, these overweight people, they're such a problem. You know, and it's like, we got to solve that, you know, fix them. And I, I just, I really hated that. Um, so I don't know, my answer to this is more along the lines of, because it's fun. What yeah, um, I've been reading a lot of Alan Watts recently, uh -huh. and he has a very uh, interesting take on this, which I sort of appreciate, which is, you know, what if, what if we didn't want to be different? What if we couldn't change ourselves? What if the world couldn't change? What if everything was just the way it is and it couldn't be changed? Um, how would you approach life different? And uh, one of the first things that you realize is that if you had that, uh, you would probably kill yourself, right? Or you would probably, you know, a lot of people link problems with purpose, right? The purpose uh -huh. of people's lives is to make something better, make something right. improved. Um, I, in our first reaction to a, a completely perfect uh, self is that, oh, well, what do I do now? And so you create a new problem, right? The new problem is, you know, how do I, you know, you know, do something that hasn't been done before? How do I go somewhere that hasn't been gone before? Like, how do I, so you create a problem. The question is, is whether or not that instinct is correct. And I think that maybe, you know, it makes sense in, in our day-to-day -day lives to come up with problems in order to have purpose. Mm -hmm. But maybe maybe we all do revert to a point at some point where we accept ourselves for who we are. We, we feel like we belong in the world, that we don't have to change. Um, I think that's a great, you know, if we can get over that fact that we feel in like, like uh, yeah. a bit. Well, it just uh, would require so much work on yourself to get to the point of self-acceptance. 
right? No, you, I mean, you, the, the work is to back yourself up, right? Like, yeah. like, okay, well, what if all these problems didn't exist? And that's, that is work, but um, it's, it's the removal of, of, of things from your brain, not the addition of, of solutions. I just, in my life, I categorize uh, two quality levels of uh, <clears throat> things that are fun. Right? Like, to go to a new restaurant and have tasty food is an enjoyable experience. Um, we tried a float tank. I have. Oh, all right. <laughs> go ahead. Anyway, but then, and, and so, but then I always forget that restaurant. Like, a week later, I'll have forgotten about that meal. But then there's things like big problems that I've solved or tried to solve or worked on for a long time that give me a level of satisfaction that go on for years and years. Like, I still think about things that I've accomplished 10, 20, like, I mean, I mean, just to go all the way back in third grade, I wrote a report on the condor. And now I know a lot more about condors than the average person, and I feel really good about that. I don't remember any other homework assignment I did in third grade, right? And so that's, I, that's why I like big problems. That's why I like to work on big things is because it just gives me almost like a lifetime of happiness when those get accomplished. Right, so that goes back to mindset, right? Like you, yeah. you're doing something because you have to fix it or because you enjoy it or because it is an experience that feels um, rewarding in itself. And I think that you might, you might have the same end action of you know doing things, exercising, yeah. meditating, but if you do it for different reasons, it can be different. Uh -oh. Uh, we were smack in the middle of something. I missed that question. If you can, uh, the word dynamic was in there. Um, <laughs> uh, all right, we almost got it. it. I actually thought we were quick on trying to read that question, and it disappeared. Yeah, super fast. All right. Uh, wait, we we float tank. Oh, float tank. Have you, you like? It? I haven't done it yet. Oh, really? There's a great one in Oakland. I have to uh, go all the way to Oakland for this. Well, there's probably one here too, but there's one in Oakland. Actually, Rafi uh, recommended. And, yeah. Uh, it's called Float Center or something, and. You spend an hour in a big salty tank, and I had a really great experience. I went with my wife, and she had a terrifying experience. <laughs> so uh, we're gonna do it again and see if both of you. All right. Yeah, and I, I would like to bring Nico, my five, my four year old, yeah. out there too. They, I don't know if they're gonna allow it, but I really think it's a it's a you know a relaxing. It's sort of like a nap where you're awake and huh. you start. I went. I had this really strange like being buried alive, yeah. but enjoying it feeling. <laughs> and Kellyanne had a buried Kellyanne, alive. Kellyanne, yeah. Kellyanne had a, like, oh shit, what's going on? Why am I here? Yeah, that uh, sucks. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, we should get a, a affiliate outing. code for, uh, for these float tanks. We're selling it so well. Yeah, team outing. Okay, that could be our next team outing. Um, I don't know if people know, uh, a lot of people who are watching are Coach Dummy users. I don't know if people know that Buster is an advisor to Coach Dummy. Uh, and uh, so he's invited to the team outings. Um, Alex asks, a 27 year old with a $60,000 a year job is asking me, is this it? Is this what life is? Aside from platitudes, what should I tell her? I'm assuming this question came in from one of our coaches. Uh, but even if not, it's, I think it still makes sense. Uh, what do you we think? We can't do platitudes? Come on. <laughs> totally. <laughs> platitudes is all this person deserves. So, um, so first of all, I'm assuming a $60,000 a year job is also like not in San Francisco or New York, where it's like, work real hard and get a raise, I think you'd be in trouble. I mean, <laughs> here, it's just really expensive here right now. Um, uh, but anyways, it, they're disappointed that they... Spend. They checked all the boxes. They checked all the boxes. <laughs> well, you gotta get married, you gotta have kids. Oh yeah, right. No, yeah, that's you gotta the retire. There's <laughs> <laughs> just more boxes. Just keep on going down the list. Yeah, there's gonna be there's gonna be more more of them where I came from. Um, I, I think I picked this question because I'm like I've personally been thinking about what a con uh, education is. I mean, first of all, I believe in being educated, but when I look back. Like, why did I do all of this homework, right? Like, I never would have done any of this work on my own volition. I did it because I was being promised this $60,000 a year job. And then, you know, and thankfully, I figured this out really quickly. This, I graduated and started working this job at MasterCard, this really corporate IT job. And I was like, really? This is what I went to school for? This is so boring. Um, 
It was, I mean, everyone there was lovely. I don't have any problems with MasterCard as a company in particular, but uh, I just, I wasn't asked to do anything challenging and I was paid well enough that my life was comfortable, which is sort of, I think, what this person is saying. And I was just like, what? This doesn't make any sense to me. And, uh, uh, and I think that is sort of this like con of life. It's just like, uh, you got to find your, you got to make your own rewards. You got to be able to uh, think for yourself to figure out for yourself what makes you happy. Ooh, Ooh. Ella Luna's uh, book. It's probably a good one to recommend. I really enjoyed her take on this, which is thinking about jobs, careers, and callings. And I think one of the problems with this checklist model of living is that they're all shoulds. Like you should do this, you should do this, you should do this. All the way down, you never really figure out what do you what do you want to do, right? right. And what what do you enjoy doing? What, right. What's calling to you? Um, and you know, she's got a great way of articulating this answer. Um, I saw her talk a couple weeks ago in a writer book. It's it's really good. Wait, um, what is the book called? It's called The Crossroads of Should and Must. It just came out a couple weeks ago. Oh, uh, she wrote a blog post on Medium about a year ago. Yeah, and um, she was the, the on the on the design team for the Mailbox app. Yeah, and it's been a couple other places but then she she quit and you know moved to another country and found a white room from her dream and started painting and yeah right. really shifted her, her her thing right um because a ton of people wanted her to work on their startup right I, like i haven't t i know a couple of people that were recruiting her really hard and she was like well i should do that a lot of people think i should use my you know my credibility from this mailbox app uh um you guys should do more of these. Thank you so All much. All right. You, sh you guys should press the hearts more. <laughs> if uh, we get three billion hearts, we'll do it again. That's right. Only if we get three billion <laughs> hearts. Um, the, uh, actually, I think the hearts like run into the rankings. And like, of course, I want more people to see this. Um, but yeah, I, she, made, I mean, she made a really intentional life decision to... Uh, yeah, really awesome. Great. What's your opinion on uncovering oneself, chipping away blocks versus transforming oneself? Oh. I, I'm on the chipping uh, side of things, but I don't think it, you mm -hmm. can really succeed at that unless you do have to go through a transformation. Um, so I would say transformation is ultimate goal. Um, and then the way you go about it is by wiggling lots of things and seeing what which yeah. one is a light switch that turns something on. Um, yeah, that's my personal take. I could go into that more. But. Yeah, a lot of times in the self-improvement space, people get really... Um, you know, polarized. So there's like, you know, even in like tiny habits, like one of the first things that BJ taught me when he was teaching me that methodology was, uh, it's really hard to design for epiphanies. So let's design for tiny <clears throat> habits instead. And I actually, I sort of suspicious that these things actually work in parallel, that epiphanies are rare, but very powerful. And the way that you increase them is by doing lots of work. You sort of, you create more surface area for epiphany. So example, I work with an executive coach uh, once a week, generally. Um, we meet for an hour. It's almost like therapy, you know, it's like face to face and we go into the problems of, our, of my day or my week. And a lot of times the meeting is very tactical. And about once every three months, I'll have this epiphany because I'll see this pattern that I've just been doing all my life. I'll see I'll see how I, it's been playing out at work, but also where it started, you know, even in childhood. And I don't know when these epiphanies are going to go or come, but I see that they come regularly. I think it's the same with uh, Coach Dummy is that, yeah, on your average day, I'm like, all right, avoid sweets, uh, get to the gym, find time to meditate. Like, it's just a lot of really kind of tiny tasks. But then through that, I'll have these occasional transformational changes. Mm -hmm. And I think if I wasn't working on myself, those wouldn't be coming. Yeah, you can't really intentionally go after a transformation. You really just have to um, go put yourself through things that are different and yeah. you know, experiment with things. And one of these things that you wiggle is gonna, is gonna trigger something, but you know, it's really hard to say, oh, that's the, like, what worked for, for you was you yeah. know, a, a coach or what worked for somebody else was uh, reading a book, but um, really just rather than prescribing the solution that triggered you, prescribe the solution of experimentation in general. 
my partner Sarah gives a talk on phobias and she describes she has a snake phobia and which is not a, a fear of snakes or a disgust towards snakes like I don't like I don't like to see a snake it's like actual irrational blackout level fear when seeing a snake and she was part of a study around uh, overcoming that phobia and the the people running the study said well there's two ways we can do this a, we can uh, take two weeks, gradually giving you more and more exposure to snakes, starting with showing you a picture of a snake, then letting you hold a book with pictures of snakes. That's All tiny the habits, man. Yeah, right? Or <laughs> we can lock you in a room full of snakes for two hours. And I feel like that, and, and they said, like, actually, both of these methods work equivalently, <laughs> right? And of course, you do not choose the uh, lock in a room, be locked in a room for two hours. And I, I think that's an example of, it, it's not so much that you can't ever design for transformation, but the process of designing for transformation is so unpleasant that you like you wouldn't want to go through it. Well, transform, I, I just read, I'm rereading Joseph Campbell's, the, I don't know, one of his myth books, where he talks about the hero's journey. Like, the hero uh -huh. has to go through trials, and then, but he, the end result is change, and then he comes back and, and sort of delivers that change and shares it. Right, um, but yeah, I'll, I'll, it's hard to to know which trials are gonna create the change. Mm -hmm. um, I was thinking of people that. Uh, yes. Are we going to have a replay available? So let's take an aside here. <clears throat> uh, Buster, you are spending some time at Twitter these days because you work there. I do. Uh, this Periscope thing is pretty fun. But what are we going to do with it? So we're, we get, they keep it on their site for 24 hours? At the end of this, it'll, I think, be archived for 24 hours. You can't download it, and I, and I think it gets saved to your role, too. Right. Um, so you can post it somewhere else, but it, will, it won't have the conversation in the hearts. Oh, really? Right. Oh, that's frustrating. Yeah. Oh, so this would be interesting. This so, is ephemeral. So that's why we should always read the questions out loud. Yeah. And then, so... I'll have it on my camera roll, which means that if I wanted to, to post it to YouTube, I could turn it into a podcast and put it out on iTunes, yeah. which is the standard social media oh, yeah. advice, right? Just SoundCloud or feed it out to yeah. as many places as possible. Um, open to ideas, though. If you guys have suggestions for what to do, we're, we're novices. <laughs> Everyone is a Periscope novice. Uh, New question. All right, new question. That's a tough one. We need tough ones. That's how Tim Ferriss does it. YouTube would be great. Cool. Um, oh, yeah. I chose this question for Buster specifically. Uh, what is... Troy in uh, Toledo asks, <laughs> what is the quickest way to bring about bucket list thinking? You know, basically that life is short and requires meaning. Thanks. One of the reasons I like this question is one of the few questions that... Uh, that said thank you. Mm. But I also like this question because I feel like you think about death more than I do. <laughs> I think about death all the time. Oh, no. <laughs> I've done grim. Yeah, no, well, okay. So bucket list thinking, the whole point, bucket list is an interesting term because it's from a movie where this guy's gonna die and he, ha he suddenly realizes, oh my gosh, I should make something in my life. I should make a list of things to do before I die. Um, which I think, so that the answer is really, you know, contemplating death is a great, motivator um, and you know we're always trying to find motivation like what's going to motivate me to exercise what's going to motivate me to, to learn Spanish what's going to motivate me to uh, you know do this thing that I really want to do death is like this endless supply of panic right where you suddenly realize wow this is all going to end um, what am I wasting all this time for like every single day is something that you know is a depleting supply and you can tap into that. Like, well, one of the one you could, you could think about death, and we, I sort of call it the mortigo moment, where you're, you're just like you start to get dizzy with like this feeling of like, oh my gosh, it's all going to end, and that can be translated into um, panic and despair and depression, or it can be channeled into it can be channeled. And, and I, as a kid, I would freak myself out every single night thinking about this, and I would you know want to be asleep and beg my parents to explain to me why what death was all about, but. There's a, there's a way to to after stop after you stop panicking if you do it often enough um, it turns into this feeling like oh my gosh the world is sparkling like it's like 
you know, this is something that's such a rare opportunity in the history of the universe to have this first person experience of the universe where I'm consciously moving through it. Um, what should I do? Like, I'm this, you know, you know this hero in this, in this movie that I'm only I get to watch and there aren't any real barriers other than your own self-narrative. So you start to think about, well, maybe I should shift from this idea of stockpiling everything for some grand retirement to a, 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 a you know, maybe I should enjoy the things that are happening right now. I sort of imagine like this, you've got this bag of M&Ms. You can either save the bag of M&Ms and you don't know when it's gonna be taken away from you and you don't know how many are in there. When do you eat the first one? You can eat the first one today, right now, or you could wait until you're 80 years old and start eating the M&Ms. Um, I'm, I think, you know, bucket list mentality is all about thinking about, let's enjoy M&Ms right now. Um, yeah. Let's not only do that, but also think about how do we, you know, I don't want to burn through the entire bag of M&Ms in 10 seconds and feel sick, but think about, you know, what is it about the world that is enjoyable yeah. and how do I go about enjoying it? So you thought about death for so many years, for 10 or 20 years, and then came out the other side into happiness? It was a very stumbling <laughs> journey. But I see. Yeah, it, I don't think it's it's a it was an undirected journey, and I think that we all could be doing it more. Like the reason we don't think about death is because it's unpleasant, but there is a really nice epiphany at the end if you if you go through it. Um, someone asked about quantified studies, and I'll get back to that in a sec. Um, the you know. At first, when you started talking about the sort of uh, the, the the motivational aspects of it, of just uh, it reminded me of a story uh, that um, about uh, Michael Jordan and how he would look for motivation everywhere. Like, if he could, like, the best thing that could happen is that he, like, someone would like slight him, like a. Uh, an arena worker would like not hold the door open for him on the way into a the visit you know to a, a, an away game and he would be like I'm gonna show that away worker I'm gonna score 40 points tonight right and it, it like it kind of it kind of showed me how lacking in motivation all of us are like here's a guy that's like desperate for more motivation because he can't generate enough himself even and that's a pretty motivated guy and, but I also, I think of him as sort of miserable, right? That, um, uh, you know, his Hall of Fame induction uh, speech was all about how he'd showed, you know, he proved all these people wrong, like dating all the way back to high school. And I was just like, bro, you like, calm down. Like, you're, you're great. Like, this is a time for you to be magnanimous. And he just couldn't really do it. So that's why, like me personally, I worry about getting too obsessed with negativity because I find that for me it's really sort of all-encompassing I think um, like I try to stay really positive because I've had times in my life where I got kind of negative and it wasn't just like I, it wasn't about being depressed it was about being mean like it just turned me mean I was always looking at things that were wrong in people and the people around me and I just I try really hard to avoid that um, and there's some part of just thinking about death that is uh, that is the same for me. I actually I almost have the opposite viewpoint. I never think about death, and I think of like I just start out by thinking I could do anything and everything. And uh, I don't know if that's... you're just setting yourself up for supreme disappointment. Yeah, totally, totally, totally. When I'm 80, <laughs> I'll be like, I still haven't won. Like I still think I might win like uh, the like win state meet. I like double in the mile and two mile and win both events. I think it's too late for me to be competing in high school races. <laughs> um, do we have any questions? We would take a, another question. Oh, someone asked this question and I wrote it down. Yeah, more questions if you have any about anything. Doesn't have to be about... Are there going to be more quantified studies such as the quantified diet? Would we do one on meditation? Um, for people who don't know, we, did, we sent 12,000 people through a pretty rigorous scientific study on the effect of 10 different diets. And what we found essentially is that any diet that's not the standard American diet is going to lead to weight loss. The standard American diet is terrible. 
Um, we also found that, I mean, I guess I could tell you that paleo and slow-carb diet uh, could potentially lead to more weight loss over the first four weeks, which is all our study uh, showed. But I actually, I'm, I'm more interested in the effect of this study because we did another one that wasn't nearly as complicated on meditation. And what it said was um, people who succeed start small and don't worry about failures. The people who fail, they all tell the exact same story. They say, I sat down for only 20 minutes and I couldn't keep a clear mind, not even for 20 minutes, therefore I'm not cut out for this. And so success or failure was 100% attributed to um, expectations. If you expect to keep a clear mind, which by the way, uh, never happens, um, then you're going to think you're failing. And so anyways, but so what, what you're saying is that the diet itself was not important. What mattered is your expectations and that the diets yeah. are not designed to change expectations. Right, right. And it's also, it's like, well, what was, what's the point of this research? Does it give people, do people need this research to give them more confidence? Right, I, I didn't feel like we were discovering things. I felt more like we were supporting things that were already common sense and good ideas. And um, I've actually had more success with the meditation front because I had to say, like, this, like, everyone should be able to learn a meditation practice, in my mind, in my opinion, because there's no wrong way to do it. The only way to fail at meditation is to believe there's a wrong way to do it, essentially. That's what our data uh, showed. Uh, but it all goes back to your identity and how you think and you know, we, we externalize the solution as saying like, oh wait, these, these, these pro programs, these apps, these services are gonna solve my problems, when really the problem is, you know, internal and um, it's very personal. And that's why I think things like meditation and free writing and yeah. um, like just thinking about what your brain is primed for and, and having a, a way to talk to yourself in a friendly way, disambiguating the different voices and beliefs and values in your head and having you know, making progress there is going to have so much more um, impact in the long run than saying, well, was it paleo or, or slow carb? Like, right. It's like the, the, the difference in, in quality there is, is zero. People are spend too much time optimizing. You know, one of my theories on the self-improvement <clears throat> industry is that all of the advice works uh, because it's being compared to... Um, Doing, sitting on the couch and doing nothing. And uh, people spend a lot of time wondering, well, you know, is this really going to work? Well, yeah, it's going to work. Um, Open the business model for coaches paying for their clients. I think I might guess that this question, this is a question from a coach asking if they can use Coach Me as an add-on service to their existing clients, and in which case the coach would actually rather pay for the service. And we're getting that question a lot recently, which maybe is a sign. I want to ask, I want to pull this question that was asked earlier. Um, yes. Uh, I feel lazy and demotivated and do not feel like making goals. Would you have advice for me? Well, this is like, there's, there's a lot to unpack here. I like, love first this of all, question. Should you be making, we're like, <laughs> you know, this is totally the, going back to the Aluna thing, like, He's not. This person is not saying they want to be making goals. They feel like they should be making goals. Right. Who told you you should be making goals? You did. The two of us. <laughs> no, it wasn't, it wasn't me. <laughs> but the other thing is that you're motivated to ask this question. So what's motivating? What's motivating Vidya to ask this question in the first place? And this goes back to, um, I don't think you lack motivation. You're obviously motivated to look for answers. You just don't know what the problem is. You want a problem. And of course, if you want a problem, you could create a problem. The problem could be, you know, I don't have enough goals or the problem could be, um, why is this voice in my head telling me that I should have goals? And I would, I would say that the latter is probably the real, it's not a real problem. It's probably a more interesting problem to tackle of the two if you had to choose one. Hmm. Well, and it's a lot harder. There's no app that's salty. Why, why do I feel this way about, you know, why, why do I have these expectations? Uh, right. And a, a commenter is yeah. saying, and, and he or she is probably less lazy than they think. Yeah, that, I mean, that's the thing, too. But they feel bad. They feel, they feel guilt around 
um, not being more proactive, which is, I think, something that we all have. Yeah. And we are all trained to have this feeling that there's a problem out there, we're not good enough, um, you know, we have to do something to prove our value. And, you know, that's, that's sort of what all these other apps and services feed off of. So you can either continue to allow it to be this, this motivation of guilt, or you can, you can go back to the source. Uh, so like the coach on me business relies on people feeling this way. Not necessarily. I think self-help in general. Buster just <laughs> kneecapped the whole company. Um, the, what, I'm interested in this question too, just because there's these uh, these cycles. I know, like for me, Saturday morning is a really lazy and demotivated time. Like, put a lot into the week, and then not a lot happens for me till midday. So, but like everyone has this this like period where they're lazy and not motivated and like, that's okay right I think it's okay so what but so the thing I, I've been thinking about there is that then just what's the most intentional way I can spend my time during that so this like really you know this question uh, do I have advice for you, you say, you're lazy and demotivated I was like oh yeah these are my favorite TV shows is like the advice I want to give mm -hmm. like why don't you watch I mean I, like everyone is watching Game of Thrones but like uh, I, there's a ton of good TV on and the change that I tried to make was mm -hmm. not watching uh, my, TV mindlessly which is stuff that I've done certainly at some points in my life and so I like I don't have cable I basically only binge watch TV but to me binge watching TV is perfectly acceptable mm -hmm. I've chosen that as something that I want in the mix of my yeah. life yeah what if you just revert to cat mode where you're like I'm now a cat um, what do I want to do take a nap do I want to lay in the sun do I want to sip some water from my bowl do yeah. I want to chew on some wheatgrass <laughs> like you know live like a cat for a while and, and then like let your body recover or like let your mind and you know mental state you know catch back up to you know where it has energy and motivation again I would say like right don't and don't feel bad about it I think that's you know yeah. a, a cat doesn't feel guilty you know one of, one of the r real common tactics in uh, what behavior design or goal uh, chasing goals is around framing and reframing so you could just reframe this whole thing as your goal should be to be lazy like make your goal be lazy it seems yeah. like you're feeling like being lazy embrace it make that your goal uh, totally. a really lazy way to be lazy is to be a cat yeah <laughs> absolutely that's like be the, fun too. the king of laziness and all you're doing is sitting on your couch worrying that's terrible you're doing a terrible job of being lazy um, yeah all right do we we could take more questions although I do have this one which is sort of related um, do you have favorite go-to short sayings like practice patience persistence thanks yeah keys phone wallet that's fine <laughs> <laughs> I do too I, I have um, I don't have keys phone I have like prime words I, I think that we go through the day like and we're automatically primed by our environments where right. we, we see things and then we start noticing more of those things and then suddenly you're like noticing all the slow people because you're on the escalator and people were in the wrong lane um, versus like what if I primed my brain with confidence or um, attention and I started noticing what what's confident in my environment right now what's attentive in my environment right. right now and you start noticing all this amazing stuff you're like wow that that water pitcher is just like totally just being itself in a confident way and you start noticing it in other people you yeah. start noticing how even insecurity it can be like a, a sign of confidence and like you know that's just like one example of you know priming yourself but to experience you something use different. something around quality time is that still part of so that's something that you're really on, on the lookout for. Yeah. And do you still use this other app for it? No. Uh, <laughs> I use I use my brain, my brain's yeah. app for, I have quality time. I have this word called levitas, which is the opposite of gravitas, of like, look for the lightness in everything, of like, yeah. how are things light and, and easy? And um, another one called lucidity, which is just like, you know, who's paying attention? And yeah. am I paying attention? Um, and these are just like, I don't, I'm not, I'm not trying to, embody them myself I'm actually just trying to think about them and notice them and that changes my lens that I go about my day for a brief period of time 
I stopped making New Year's resolutions. It just didn't make sense. I'm like running an app where I'm constantly putting new goals into it. And I started doing New Year's themes. And so last year, my theme was hyperbole, which I, like, I think cracked a lot of people in my life up. But I just, I felt like, you know, we should go for it. We should go big. And I just wanted that to be really a part of my way of thinking. And then this year, my theme was joy. Because I, my sort of my normal... MO is like pretty intellectual. It's like I'm either at work, working out, or like, you know, it's like I spent a lot of time in New York, so we're at museums, we're doing all this cultural stuff. And I wanted to really look for things that are just like flat out funny and fun and made me uh, just happy. And those things are my friends. It's, uh, you know, we can choose a lot of times for what to do at night, we can choose comedy. And um, and dancing and all of those things, uh, and so that for me that's my like prime word for the year is joy. And of course, I, I habitually forget it because I chose it for a reason. I felt like my life was unbalanced, and I wanted to balance it out a little bit more. How often do you think about joy, or how often? You think? About once a week, you know. I'm like, oh right, joy. I'm going to work on that. Um, and same, it was the same with hyperbole. Yeah. I was like. Ah. But by the end of the year, I, I was better at recognizing when this is a hyperbolic moment. And, you know, I don't know. What's a lot an example of, of a hyperbolic moment? Well, actually, the example that comes up all the time is when we're explaining mm -hmm. the value of a coach. So we actually, we broke it, we tried all of these ways to explain the value of a coach. And it turned out that basically nothing works unless a person is energized to make that, to make a change. And so this, like, you know, like a title like The 4-Hour Work Week, it's a hyperbolic title. Mm -hmm. It's not actually what the book is about, you know, and so, uh, but it gets you energized. And then you have to immediately follow up with a bunch of practical stuff. A success story to help, say, like, show that this has happened to other people. And then the actual technique, he, like, here's the science and process that we use, right? Uh, but... Though without the hyperbole, people don't do anything. And uh, I think that's actually really true of all of self-improvement, is that a lot of it is uh, powered by fantasy. And I don't know how you, like a lot of people feel like fantasy is inauthentic. Uh, I just feel like it's pragmatic. Like we, you have to, uh, you have to accept that we are not rational beings and you have to play to that. Hmm. And uh, yeah, I think that perfectly encapsulates the disagreement between us <laughs> <laughs> about everything behavior change. <laughs> okay, go. <laughs> what, what's your? You don't. You don't. Buy, you don't believe in fantasy. No. But this is your. To my mind, this is your fantasy. What is my fantasy? That there is no fantasy. No, my. I mean, I guess if you want us to call everything fantasy, that would be true, which is a hyperbole. Um, but I would say that there should be one drive, um, and that should be the drive towards truth and self-knowledge and reality versus towards fantasy. And uh, if we, you know, ignore the fact that we that we're not gonna that we're gonna die, and if we ignore the fact that you know marketing is speaking to us for a reason that's not change, it's 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 business model, um, then we're la allowing ourselves to be tricked, and we're putting the control of how we are manipulated into somebody else's hands versus. If you think about, you know, the quiet changes, we all change quietly. There's a couple habits that I have where, you know, I take a picture at 8.36 every day. I did not make a big deal about that, you know, seven years ago when I started it, but it's a very quiet thing that I do and I enjoy doing. Um, and I was never promising anything. I don't have a fantasy about it, where it's going to end up. Um, other things like, you know, just talking to yourself or, you know, being kind. Like, these are, there's so many people out there that don't want to create a grandiose vision that they strive for. I would much rather be a quiet, and I, I think that they are generally neglected in the behavior change world where you know, people change in many ways. One way is to lie to them, make false promises, <laughs> and then try to deliver something in the, in the, in the, in the wake of that excitement. Um, another one is to um, help them coach themselves or help them um, know themselves better. Well, I will say without uh, getting into a big argument right now. <laughs> We're running out of time for you to give us hearts. Um, 
And uh, unless a question comes in uh, very shortly, I think we should wrap this up. Because this is actually, I feel like we could uh, do a whole scope cast number two on uh, lies told by the self-improvement industry. And it would actually not be a super critical show because I'm always interested in why was this lie told and why was why did it end up working out well for for people and um, uh, you know the example I always give is this book The Secret which sold 19 million copies to people who now believe that beams of positive energy literally come out of our eyes but the end result is if you read and believe that book your life will be better. I don't know. If you ask 99% of the people that read that book, their life was better? I think 100%. Their life was better, at least for a period All right. of time. Well, yeah. Let's do another one on that topic. All right. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for the questions and the hearts. I mean, seriously, get those hearts in. I'm going to add some. Um, uh, so Ameri- this culture is, is American-specific. Yeah, that makes sense. So people in other cultures aren't trying to improve themselves? They're not as marketed to, maybe? Yeah. Maybe. Huh. Right. It's definitely an American industry of of self-improvement. Because anything's possible, and promises are made. All I have to do is spend $30 or $250, and it'll change you in seven days. Like, that's the American dream right there. So. All right. I I I feel like uh, we should sign off. Uh, Thank you very much.